also welcome some of you travel from the board. Um, so we are going to start the school in a few minutes. Um, so again, the, for the internet connection uh, information, you're welcome to either report on the blackboard or on the information attached with your virtual. And there will be the drink or also restroom outside. If you need any help, you can either uh, look for me or Chong Wen or the secretary on the aisle for whatever the, the help you need. Yeah. Okay, so Chong Wen is over there. Okay. So uh, I think the, we would like to have this uh, lecture in a very slightly more in, informal way. So especially for the students, are encouraged to ask the, whatever the simple or basic question just to not instead of like a giving really a, like a seminar talk, but a, have some more interaction between the audience and the speaker. Okay. And then any question? No? Okay. Then I will ask the Professor Young to introduce the speaker. So good morning, everybody. It's good to see that so there are so many young faces whom I have never seen before. So that means the feeling is still Life. Uh, the first talk of this year's uh, summer school will be given by Professor Mark Van Hagen from Mines. A couple of days ago, I tried to recall how many times you have been here with us. And my recollection is this will be your fifth trip to Taiwan. Is that correct? I think so. I must come myself. Okay. <laughs> so that means that the old man's memory is still reliable, right? Uh, Mark has made uh, many important contributions to hydronic physics. And one of them is um, on the two photon physics. Um, his pioneering work in 10 years ago actually um, stimulated or ignite tremendous interest on the question of two photon exchange contributions to the electron photon scattering. So it is most fitting that we have him here today to tell us the most recent development, both experimentally and uh, theoretically, in the game of two photon physics. So that's what I'm up. So yeah, thanks a lot for the, the welcome and the organizers. And I indeed also was looking uh, so how many times I, I've been here, and I think yeah, five or six. Yeah. But maybe more importantly, I noticed that um, I came in 2001. With, I don't know which uh, if this was held every year in school, but the 14th, the 17th. So it, probably it was around the, the 40th. So. Um, but it was in winter at that time, if I remember well. It was in January. So it keeps shifting, probably. And it was also um, in Huadin, so it was in the, in the mountain there. So it was a nice place. So I'm, anyway, happy to be back in Taiwan. And um, so I'd like um, these three lectures to, um, to tell you um, some recent developments in the field of two photon physics. And before really entering, I mean, my lectures, um, I would like, as I'm the first speaker here, I'd like to uh, position um, this field of nuclear physics in a more general context. And um, so let me talk about some frontiers of the standard model. So I, I chose here some old world map. Actually, it's a historically, um, it's an important world map. Actually, it dates back to, um, the year 1459, so this is by a monk from Venice, actually an Italian monk, who was doing this for the, I think it was the, the king of Portugal, and it reflects the, the known world at that time. So basically this is like uh, 50 years or so or less than 50 years before the, the great discoveries. So we have the American continent and Australia, for instance, are not on this map, but otherwise one can see remarkable detail already, and I will come back to some of the detail here. So, um, But let me first um, 
show why I'm, um, why I'm showing you this. Because at the time, um, so yeah, one thought, uh, one understands basically, or one has a good knowledge of the world. And so we know, of course, that um, shortly afterwards, this map was completely redrawn. So, um, so the, because one was pushing in, in different limits, and so instead of arriving at the same place from the other side, one has discovered some new uh, frontiers. And so the present day frontiers in the, in the standard model of nuclear particle physics, I mean, are this, um, shown here. So on the one hand, there is the high energy frontier. So I will come in a few more details back to that. Then there is so-called precision or luminosity frontier. And there is also a, a low energy frontier, maybe I put it here on the bottom because usually the continents on these maps, which were, which is nowadays Antarctica and Australia, were have often been described as terra incognita. And we will see why it's terra incognita. Now, before describing you these frontiers, actually it drew my attention when I came here how much was really known, at least to the European scholars at the time, about. Um, East Asia, and there is actually a detail here of the same map here in East Asia, and they say that's why this map historically is important. For the Europeans, this was actually the first map where Japan was shown in such detail. And of course, Taiwan is not shown on this map. I, was <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to say so, but it would not be correct, because the, for the Europeans, the first confronted on the map were the Dutch, and I think this was like uh, 1650, so it was, uh, but the Portuguese already mentioned it earlier, but it was still 100 years later. So uh, so this island here is, a, is not Taiwan, but this is probably, <coughs> according to the description, I was reading part of Indonesia, so uh, at least what they, uh, what they thought at the time. So um, anyway, so um, it's um, interesting yeah, to see indeed that um, or at that time, so uh, there was quite some connection uh, between Europe and, uh, and East Asia. So now let's go to these frontiers in a bit more detail. So on the, the one hand, so the high energy frontier, so I um, think you know, um, now in the last year, so the main uh, discoveries here um, are going on at uh, LHC, where the Higgs has, has been discovered. And just one of the signals here of the um, decay into two photons. There are many, many more channels where one sees that peak. And where searches for new physics are going on, and with the upgrade, the luminosity upgrade of the LHC coming <coughs> online, so, um, so those searches um, will be intensified in the next few years. And it, it will be seen if, um, if at the scales, uh, typically like um, 10 TeV, where one is uh, sensitive if one does see new physics or if there is really um, um, a gap um, which one also has to understand. So this is definitely um, one of the main um, topics um, at the um, forefront of present day research. Now on the precision frontier, one can also test the standard model, in this case at low energies. And if one tests it at low energies, one can, through precision, and in quantum mechanics, we know um, precision physics is coming in by uh, having loop corrections. One can also um, access such new physics. And there is a very famous example, which is the, the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, which is shown here. So as you all know, so in the classical theory, or the um, original theory, non-relativistic theory by Bohr, so the degeneracy, um, of the levels, um, this is here, for instance, shown for the uh, n equal two level, and so the Dirac theory, the relativistic theory, uh, has a fine structure. So there is a, a splitting, and so the levels with different values of um, of total angular momentum j will be split in two. So in the case here of the um, n equal two level, there will be the um, Three half total angular momentum three half and total angular momentum one half level, which I split, and so around 19 uh, towards the end of the 1940s, 
there was a, a Fergus split, so the, the two, the total angular momentum one half is actually uh, split in two. So there is a two P one half and a two S one half, and the two S one half is shifted compared to the two P um, one half, and this is called the lamp shift. So this is due to quantum corrections and actually the understanding, theoretical understanding of these corrections, they led the foundation of modern quantum field theory. So here, uh, several Nobel Prize physicists, I think this is Feynman, and this is uh, Schwinger, and this is, I forgot, uh, this is Lamb. Um, so I've shown here at the Sheldrick Island conference uh, discussing these results. And a few examples over the years which are of relevance is the, the weak mixing angle, where to uh, precision measurements at different scales, one also tries to access um, new physics. And another example which I revealed in one of the further lectures is the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, G minus two, searches for electric dipole moments and the understanding of atomic physics in uh, detail. I will come back to that. Now, because these um, observers are quite um, quite varied, and there is actually a whole list varied, I mean, just quoted a few famous examples, one, can, one is um, sensitive to scales which may be um, much higher than the scales which one can directly access by accelerating particles through some energy. So there is a real interplay between these frontiers in the search for new physics. So you would, you would refrain from yourself by listing by including this proton radius. Well, proton radius, I will, uh, I will talk about this, but this is what I would call here atomic physics. Yeah. So uh, let me then also show you the third frontier, so this low energy frontier of terra incognita. So this is the realm um, of Hadron physics, and so this is the, um, the theory of strong interactions or complex systems. So, so we know the theory of strong interactions, at least um, we think we know it. At short distances to quite some accuracy, and there will be several lectures which will uh, show that if you probe uh, hadrons with high enough um, energy or momentum transfer, you can really see or map out individual quarks or um, eigenvalence quarks or C quarks or gluons between these quarks. Now, we all know that these are not the particles uh, we see directly in the detectors. So in detectors, typically, you see um, protons, neutrons, and light nuclei, or you see um, collective excitations of these nuclei, or for instance, uh, if you accelerate um, uh, heavy ions to each other, you can see a phase where you have um, a quark gluon plasma. Now, all these um, systems, I mean, should be understandable from these basic building blocks, and the main question here is, so how can one understand this varied hadron structure, like mass and spin? How does it emerge from its underlying degrees of freedom, quarks and gluons? And I just, so this is typical uh, for a complex system. I don't know if someone has seen this picture, maybe not such a nice representation here, but this is actually um, a graphical representation of a network, a Wikipedia network in this case. And so what is shown, on, on every, um, every dot here is a, is a concept or um, a word which is connected or which is linked to some other concept. And so this is shown here, there's some detail here, just to show the connections. And normally, if everything would be connected randomly, you would just see some uniform block here, but it's not happening. And of course, this is not planned, so no one planned these connections, they just happen uh, spontaneously or semi-spontaneously maybe, and some structures do emerge. So the same here, so, so we need to, um, to understand such uh, emerging structures. And I will also come back to that, and I think several of the, the lectures I've seen will also discuss here quantities such as the, the spin, for instance, of, uh, of protons, um, how it, it's understandable from quarks and gluons. Now let me just uh, phrase here a few of the basic uh, questions in hadron physics. So it's basically the realm of strong QCD. And so what is shown here is the famous plot, the coupling constant of um, a gluon to a, a quark, which is the 
a strong coupling constant alpha s, and its scale depends, so as function of the, the scale, virtuality, with which one probes this. So in GEV, and we know if we go to large enough um, momentum transfer, there is asymptotic freedom, which means the, the, the quarks um, uh, behave perturbatively, so there is a weak coupling typically when one is at, um, at the z-pole, which has been measured quite accurately, the coupling constant is slightly larger than 0 0.1, so it means one can make a perturbative expansion. If one goes to, to scales which are typically in the realm of masses where the spectrum of hadrons is sitting around 1 to 3 or 4 GB here, for light quarks, one sees coupling constants in the range 0 0.3 to 0.5, so that's why, in contrast to the theory of quantum electrodynamics, a simple perturbative expansion will not work. And so basically, given such a theory, the question is how can we unravel um, this theory of strong coupling? So how can we understand up in its quantities such as what is the origin of mass, spectrum, and the spin? How can one image hadrons, which means um, how can we uh, extract wave functions of hadrons in terms of quarks and gluons? Now, I already alluded to, um, to this precision frontier, and actually in most of these, if not all of the examples I've shown you before, if you really want to access new physics from precision quantities, you have to know, you have to know the well-known physics before. And in all these quantities, one is limited, or frontier basically is determined by the hadronic corrections or the understanding of the hadronic corrections. So, so knowing um, with higher precision the hadronic physics input has an important impact on the standard model test and uh, these new physics searches. And so I will show you the example of the anomalous magnetic bond of the muon. So there is weak mixing angle, um, dark photon searches, there might be also a talk on this. And Proton radius puzzle will actually devote this first lecture to this subject. And the theoretical tools um, in order to, uh, to come to this uh, up in its description of hadron physics is on the one hand uh, direct numerical calculation by lattice PCB, and we will have talks on this. And secondly, effective field theories. So if one is in um, a specific energy region where one can integrate out some of the degrees of freedom, one doesn't need to, to deal with all the complexity. So one can make quite predictive um, um, calculations and one can use, combine it with phenomenology to connect with data and extract the effective coupling constants and um, from such a comparison. I will also show you some examples of this. So let me give you the outline what I'd like to do in the three lectures. So in the first lecture, so um, I'll discuss something which became known in the last few years as the proton radius puzzle, which is actually the largest um, uh, discrepancy right now um, which exists in nuclear particle physics. So um, we have to understand it. So what is the origin? And so just in a nutshell, the proton size is extracted from the muonic hydrogen spectroscopy versus electron-proton scattering shows a difference. I will quantify this. And the main uncertainty which is entering in this comparison are hadronic or two-photon corrections. So that's why it fits in this, um, in this subject. And I'd like to, to show you this in some detail. In the second lecture, I would like to, um, uh, to come back to uh, a subject which is about 10 years old and which has seen continuous developments. So by precision elastic electronuclear scattering, so one has seen deviations between um, uh, different uh, observables. And if, if one is uh, precise enough in scattering leptons from nucleons, one cannot just uh, limit oneself to um, an exchange of one photon. So that's why one has to go beyond and look at two photon exchange effects. And so here, so uh, this is mainly a precision tool of hadron structure. Uh, which emerged over the past decade or so, which requires the inclusion of these corrections, and there's a whole uh, physics program which has also is ongoing in this field. 
And in the third lecture, I'd like to, um, to discuss two photon processes, but direct production processes where two photons uh, fuse and give rise to hadrons. And these processes have a, are interested on, in their own uh, right, but they have an important um, consequence, namely they constrain the hadronic light by light corrections to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which are the leading hadronic uncertainties in the search for uh, beyond standard model physics in this observable. So um, I would like before starting um, to say that if anyone has a question at any time, please feel free to just ask it right away, as it was said. And then, so um, you can easily uh, interrupt me. So in this lecture, I would like to discuss probably the most recent subject first, which is the proton radius puzzle. And just in a nutshell, before starting, so, uh, so why do we care? Um, so if we have um, any a system, so okay, just here uh, one system. So how do we know uh, how the system looks like? Or how do we image the system? So in general, so in the case here, biology, so people are using some uh, electron microscopes and they can reveal quite some detail of objects. And the same is done also with the subatomic particles. And the interpretation is simple when a target, such as this beast, is static, which means that the mass of this target or the mass of constituents making up this target is much larger than the typical uh, resolutions, which is the momentum transfer. So if one scatters with an electron from a, a target, then there is a momentum transfer here. And if this momentum transfer is much smaller than the mass of the target, so to first approximation, this is just frozen, so it will not, uh, not move. Yeah. And one can make a Fourier transform, um, three-dimensional Fourier transform of quantities which are called form factors, which give them, in the case here, for instance, of subatomic particles, which give the distribution of electric charge and magnetization in space. Now, just to quantify this a little bit, so you are all familiar with this, I suppose. So if one is doing elastic or inelastic electron scattering, so scattering of electrons on the target, when this, for instance, a nucleon, when this stays a nucleon, it's called elastic scattering. When, it's, when more particles are produced here, it's called inelastic scattering. Is the microscope here to investigate the structure of this target. And in the simplest uh, approximation, where this electron um, exchanges one photon with this target, so when this is a spin one half target as a nucleon, one can describe its structure by two so called form factors. And so the matrix element of the electromagnetic current between initial final state is given in Dirac the Dirac structure by so the two nucleon spinners, and then there's the vector current, gamma mu, and then there is a tensor current, or induced um, tensor current, so sigma mu nu times the momentum transfer q nu. And there are two scalar functions here, um, so this, which are functions of the virtuality, um, the square of this momentum transfer. And the capital Q squared usually denotes the negative of this momentum transfer, so in order to be a positive number. So these two form factors are usually um, known as Dirac form factor and the Pauli form factor. And in the case of an elementary particle, an electron, so as far as we know, um, so at the three level, so if there is no quantum corrections, this term is absent. So this is the so-called anomalous magnetic moment, and this gives you at q squared zero the total charge of the system. So f2 at q squared equals zero gives the anomalous magnetic moment, and in the case of the proton, this is a large number. And actually, in the early 1930s, when, um, when Stern found this, or measured this for the first time, Pauli didn't believe him, and so he dismissed the experiment initially. So saying that he made an error because the Dirac theory is showing that the, the g factor of the electron is equal to, and the difference between the g factor and two is just this anomalous moment. And of course, Pauli had to come back to his uh, 
um, initial dismissal. And um, so this is considered actually to be the first indication that there is internal structure of hadrons. Um, so 1933, this, this large anomalous magnetic moment. Now in experiments, um, I will uh, show this a bit later. One often uses instead of directly these two form factors combinations, which are just Sachs form factors. They are linear combinations of the two. So the sum of the two is the magnetic form factor. And the difference of the two, where the power form factor is multiplied with the Lorentz invariance, u squared over 4 m squared, is called the electric form factor. And I see that I messed up. So it should be exactly the way opposite here. So that's the magnetic, and that's the electric. And um, the advantage um, of uh, introducing these form factors is that for a static system, they give the distribution of electrical charge or magnetization in the system. So if we speak about, because I want to talk to you about the proton radius puzzle. So if we look at this electric form factor of a function of q squared, and if we, we look at the expansion in q squared, the leading term is just the charge. So it's one in the case of the proton. The next term is the term proportional to q squared. It has a term which is labeled or expanded as a term which is labeled as the charge radius. And because one has a, a spherical system in three dimensions, so the convention here is to take a one sixth out of this definition. And the, uh, the quantity which remains there is called the charge radius. Um, so there are further terms in this expansion, and we will also come back to those. Now, just to show you a few examples how people have done this over the, um, the decades. So a um, time on a tool um, of this electroweak probe is to look at uh, scattering um, from heavy nuclei. These are different nuclei. These starting with um, oxygen all the way to lead. So oxygen is shown here, and lead is shown here. And typically, so they're um, spherical systems. And um, so one, one is basically scattering from a disk. So one sees nice diffraction pattern, because they have a sharp, relatively sharp edge. And if one takes the Fourier transform of these diffraction patterns, one can map out here the charge density as a function of the distance. And if one goes here from oxygen to heavy nuclear lead, so one sees that in a large region um, of these nuclei, the charge density is constant, and then one has a, a, like a Fermi-type uh, distribution towards the edge. Now, we can now ask the same. So can we make such pictures for the proton? And how accurate do we know the size of the proton? And so I will come uh, back to how one can make such pictures for the proton in the next lecture. But in this lecture, I would like to address the question, how accurately do we know the size of the proton? And so why do we care why we know it accurate or not? There are two ways to access this with high precision. So one way is to do uh, high precision electron scattering, as I just explained to you, by measuring form factors. And the two main labs doing these high precision measurements, electron scattering, are a Jefferson Lab in the US, so which is now a 12 GeV machine with a high intensity beam, and MAMI in Mainz, which is a 1.6 GeV machine also with very high intensity beams. And so these machines are relatively low energy, so, but they are, um, because they have this very high intensity, they are uniquely positioned to deliver high precision data. And just to give you an example here, so this is here shown, uh, these are the spec three spectrometers and the three curlers here for the experiment uh, at MAMI. So the beam is coming in here, it scatters on the target, and the scattered electron is going in one of these spectrometers. And they have a momentum resolution of 10 to the minus four. So, which means that um, if one has a, um, uh, typical beam energy of one, one GeV, let's say, one has a resolution to better than one MeV. So, which means one can really um, uh, measure it with very high precision. And just an example here.